that's the deadline effect. It's like, you know, the power of the deadline to spur you to action. But how do you get that urgency, but without the sort of last minute panic, the, the possibility of making errors that you can't correct? I mean, all sorts of things that come with actually doing things at the last minute. I'm Rufus Griscom, and this is The Next Big Idea. Today, can you learn how to work like it's the last minute before the last minute? In the fall of 2019, Chris Cox applied for a job as a seasonal salesman at Best Buy. It was a role for which he was both over and underqualified. So his application had to be a masterpiece of obfuscation and exaggeration. As he typed up his resume, he couldn't help feeling like his academic credentials, a BA from Harvard and a master's from Cambridge, were a little too highfalutin, even for a company that refers to some of its employees as the geek squad. So he only listed his high school. His work history also posed some questions. He'd spent 15 years at some of the country's most prestigious magazines, eventually rising to become chief editor of Harper's and then executive editor of GQ. The last thing he needed was for the recruiters at Best Buy to think he was some kind of intellectual, the kind of guy who'd probably balk at participating in team lifts of up to 150 pounds. So he didn't mention those jobs either. After concealing his overqualifications, Chris turned to overhyping his underqualifications, which meant bragging about the only job he'd ever had that was halfway relevant to the Best Buy position, a part-time gig he'd had during college working in a hotel's AV department. In the end, his resume was so scanty he had to jack up the font size to 16 just to fill the whole page. Somehow, though, he got the job. But that wasn't all Chris wanted. He had ulterior motives for applying to Best Buy. At the time, he was working on a book about deadlines, about why some organizations procrastinate themselves into oblivion while others rise to meet the moment. And as part of his research, he was trying to understand one deadline in particular, one that consistently embarrasses some of the biggest corporations in the country. The Black Friday frenzy, an estimated 116 million shoppers hitting the stores. Bedlam in the aisles of some of the nation's biggest retailers, shoppers fighting over garments at this Victoria's Secret in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Deep discounts triggering a free-for-all. Bargain hunters at this Georgia Walmart wrestling over pots and pans. The commotion veering out of control at an Alabama mall. Shoppers scrambling for safety as gunfire rings out. The stores in that clip, Victoria's Secret, Walmart, they know Black Friday is coming. They know customer traffic will be 10 times above normal. So why, year after year, does the onslaught always catch them by surprise? Why don't they just treat Black Friday like a deadline, one they can diligently prepare for? That's what Best Buy does. Because it turns out that unlike its rivals, Best Buy doesn't succumb to Black Friday pandemonium. And so Chris wanted to know, how do they do it? He learned the answer at a 7 a.m. all-hands meeting in the Magnolia Home Theater Room at the Best Buy at Greenacres Mall, Valley Stream, New York. Black Friday, the store manager told Chris and his new colleagues, was two weeks away. And between now and that deadline, they were going to completely overhaul the way they did business. First, they'd start stockpiling inventory. Next, Chris's Best Buy branch was going to be entirely reconfigured so that even the slowest moving customer could be moved through the aisles as efficiently as possible. By planning ahead like this, they could eliminate the kind of bottlenecks that at rival stores led to squabbles, fisticuffs, and mid-aisle mosh pits. Last but not least, the deadline virtuosos at Best Buy HQ had figured out how to make every employee invested in the success and efficiency of Operation Black Friday. They stopped tracking individual sales and set store-wide goals instead. This innovation, as Chris saw when he reported back for duty on Black Friday morning, meant that everyone could quit worrying about their own sales and instead hand off shoppers from one employee to another, shuttling them through the store as swiftly as pinballs. In his new book, The Deadline Effect, How to Work Like It's the Last Minute Before the Last Minute, Chris writes, quote, it was an eye-opening lesson in how even a giant corporation could remake itself to meet the challenge of one particularly important deadline. 
It was also reminiscent of similar feats of productivity he'd seen other organizations pull off during his reporting. Chris's book focuses on organizations that have learned how to manipulate deadlines to their advantage. Like the ski bums in Colorado who gave themselves a dummy deadline, one that was earlier than necessary, to make sure they got an entire mountain covered in fake snow before the ski season kicked into high gear. Or the aviation engineers in Alabama who can promise an airline they'll deliver a plane on a specific day 10 years from now and actually do it. Chris shows how you can learn from these organizations to turn deadlines from something you fear into a superpower for boosting your productivity and stimulating your creativity. One of our goals here at the Next Big Idea Club is to find powerful new ways to connect readers and writers. And one way we've been doing that is hosting virtual book launch events where we put brilliant authors in conversation with one another. That's what we've done with Chris. He spoke with Rivka Gulchin. She's an MD, acclaimed novelist, New Yorker contributor, and a creative writing professor. Talk about someone who must be good at meeting deadlines. And who was enforcing those deadlines? Chris, as it happens, was her editor when he was at Harper's. This is a really wonderful conversation about productivity, creativity, and how on earth to get it all done. I learned a lot from this one. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. I'm Kwame Christian, and I am the CEO of the American Negotiation Institute, and I want you to check out my podcast, Negotiate Real Change. Listen to conversations with leaders in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space, and learn the secrets behind what it really takes to become a successful advocate, ally, and change maker in your organization. Check out Negotiate Real Change on your favorite podcast player. like such a I've known Chris for many years but it's so marvelous because he's just he's always one who listens he's not really one who tells you what he's thinking about and it's so magnificent to get to read the book because I feel like almost every page has the kind of information on it where you sort of call out to whoever's in the room with you oh my god did you know about the etiology of the term (laughs) for deadline did you know this did you know that and it's just full of kind of kind of little easter eggs of anecdote and joy on top of being a wonderful piece of thinking. So it was like a pleasure to get to hear you thinking on paper. Um, So thank you for writing the book. And I guess I wanted to start with a, a sort of obvious question. You have a lot of interest when you work in magazines, you're sort of getting a master's degree every two weeks in a new subject. And what was it about this that pulled together a lot of your interest and made you commit to doing a whole book. It's true. To be at a magazine, especially a magazine like uh, Harper's or a magazine like GQ, which are general interest magazines, as an editor, I have to sort of have a little bit of knowledge about all sorts of different subjects. But consistent through that whole process, you know, month after month, year after year, is in a very practical way thinking about time management uh, and and thinking about deadlines somewhat obsessively. And so you do spend a lot of time thinking about how to manage that process and to make sure that the magazine comes out on time. And and that actually relates to sort of what pushed me from, okay, this is something that I have to do to make my job possible to something that I wanted to research more deeply and then eventually turn into a book was it was the different experience of working at GQ and working at Harper's. So Harper's Magazine is a small independent magazine. It's been around for 165 years. GQ is a newer magazine and a glossier, fancier magazine. Uh, and it's part of a giant corporation called Condé Nast. So very different organizations. And yet somehow both were able to to consistently month after month after month put out a magazine and and it never failed like there you know there's never just a missing issue of GQ and there's never been a missing month of Harper's magazine you know in 165 years and that's that's kind of amazing especially if you know writers and editors <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. yeah well i mean harper's god bless it, is a lovely place but it's full of like weirdos and people who have their own ideas about basically everything and yet it still, as an institution, was able to to never miss a deadline, to always get a magazine out there every month. And so that was sort of maybe the very 
first origins of the book was like puzzling through that problem and why it was the case. And, you know, as I did more research, I did research into like the psychology of procrastination and into time management and also went out and embedded in a bunch of different other companies to see how they handled deadlines. Um, I started to figure out some of the answers to why places as different as GQ and Harper's could be both consistently good at meeting deadlines. Yeah, you know, um, you also sort of open the book with an assignment of um, a writer who is brilliant, um, but not sort of famous for meeting his deadlines to cover, uh, to do a profile of P. Diddy. There's a lot of expense, there's a lot of expectation, and there's no room for the piece not to come in. And I actually thought it was interesting that you assigned it to a writer who you knew would be tricky, but also you knew would do a great job. And I actually was sweating, even though I sort of assumed you wouldn't put it at the front of your book unless it kind of worked out okay. I was just sweating. And you sort of <laughs> described the Google Doc that's open that you're both able to see, but almost like magic. There's this countdown, like 24 hours before he has to turn it in. You see like two words, then you see a paragraph. And it really, it really worked. Well, how does that happen? Why is that the way the creative process <laughs> is? Like, it's not like there's anything magical about that date. I mean, I think that like the reason that this writer, whom I call John in the book, and is actually named John, um, the reason that John has some assignments that are years past due is at least in part because no one is sort of holding like taking the deadline seriously, whether it's John, definitely not John, but also his editor is also whoever else is involved. I, so I think the very fact that this was like the cover story for GQ and P. Diddy got involved and the stakes were high and he knew that and I knew that. And so we, we took the deadline seriously uh, at the beginning. So that helped. We didn't sort of say to ourselves, oh, well, we'll give this as much time as it needs, you know, or we'll get this done as, as soon as possible. Um, you know, that's fatal. And so... That was the first important part of the process. And then uh, the second came with the, 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 the strategy of the deadline. You know, basically I gave him a deadline that was as short as possible, like, like uncomfortably short. And I think all that did was it just eliminated the time that John would normally spend feeling anxious about writing the piece or trying to put off writing the piece or doing more research or whatever, you know, it is that we do when we are procrastinating. And he just had to get to work much quicker. But yeah, indeed, it, it felt like magic when like, okay, the, the deadline date has arrived and I can see these words appearing in the Google document uh, one after the other. And I felt so much relief at that moment because it is true that it would have been a real disaster if we did not have uh, an article about PDD to go with our beautiful PDD cover. So it, it all worked out at the end. The book really is focused on structural responses to deadlines and how institutions manage deadlines. And there's a, uh, a little um, aside about how, you know, Odysseus didn't use his willpower to kind of resist the siren song, but asked his crew to tie him to the mast. And what are these kind of structural approaches to making things work as opposed to willpower or going into more about like individual procrastination. So on the one hand, I felt like I left this book with a lot of ideas about how to manage my own deadlines, but that's not like your approach. Your approach is you look at people raising Easter lilies who have to have them ready in time to sell for Easter. You look at sort of Best Buy going into sort of, you know, Black, Black Friday when they're going to have to handle tons of customers. So you've gone into larger structures and you focus on them. When, when did that fork come between it being kind of how do I manage my deadline versus like how, what structures do institutions, whether it's the FDA or jean George von, von, von Gerichten and all of his restaurants, um, what do they use? Well, I, you know, I, I guess it started with a, with a dose of humility. Like, I don't think that I'm going to be able to write a book that's going to change people's psychology. Like, if you're good at, at deadlines and good at avoiding procrastination, you know, 
Hooray. Good for you. <laughs> and if you're not, I, I probably can't help you. Like, change your individual psychology. But I, I read this, like, this essay that had a big effect on my thinking called uh, Procrastination in the External Will. And that's, that's you bring up uh, Odysseus, like, that's, that's what's going on with Odysseus. It's like, he did not rely on on uh, you know his so-called onboard resources like his internal psychology to resist the sirens. He had his crew tie him to the mask to force himself to do what he wanted. And I think we can think of willpower in the same way. You know, rather than worrying about how do I increase my willpower, how do I change my psychology, how do I change the way my brain works, it's much easier to just create structures for yourself as an individual or as an organization that help and force you to stay on on deadline to help force you to be more productive or to be more creative or whatever it is you want to do. So stop worrying about your sort of natural psychological <laughs> inclinations and instead start thinking of like, you know, simple hacks and solutions and tricks that you can do to sort of keep yourself on target or keep yourself you know, aimed towards whatever it is you want you want to do. Um, and so it's true that the book is told through case studies of organizations and what they have done to help keep them on target and keep them on deadline. But I do think that those are also useful for individuals. I mean, I talk about this one experiment where some academics tested whether a mandatory deadline was more effective than uh, one that was self-imposed. And provided that your self-imposed deadline is creatively and effectively like deployed, uh, it can be as, as effective as a mandatory one. So, you know, for those of you who don't have a, an organization to rely on to get your work done, the good news is that, you know, you can set your own deadlines and if you do it smartly, they can be very effective. And uh, there's, there's a lot of kind of um, little surprises when people, uh, when different researchers have looked at deadlines and, um, a few of the ones that I found quite interesting um, and counterintuitive were the ones saying that they looked at whether not having a deadline, how not having a deadline at all affected people, and also how having a kind of more compressed, what we would think of as more stressful deadline affected completing a task or how that completion went. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit about that. Yeah. So yeah, the first thing I say to anyone who asks me for practical advice on deadlines is like, set a deadline. That's rule number one. Make it concrete. You know, don't just say like, I, I want to get this done sometime in the next three weeks or sometime in the next year or whatever it is. But you know, set yourself an actual date. There's pretty robust evidence that all things being equal, setting a deadline uh, as short as possible is the most effective strategy you can use to get things done. You know, that you might think like, oh, well, if I have three weeks to complete a project, I'm more likely to finish it than, I have, than if I have one week. But that's not really what um, people studying these things have found. And I opened the book actually talking about something that's fairly trivial, but um, the results are interesting. At the census, um, there was, I don't know if anyone can hear my three-year-old daughter crying in the background. She wants food. She wants it now. <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. She needs a short deadline for dinner. Um, yeah, so the census, they basically they did a test where they sent out 28,000 census forms and half of them, people were given two weeks and the other half, they're given one week to return them. And the people who were given one week were more likely to return the forms and also more likely to to fill them up correctly, like so that the quality of, of their census response improved. And once I started reading stuff like that, it really changed the way I thought about, I mean, first and foremost, my job as an editor. And I, I sort of had a general sense that like, your writing is a creative endeavor. You're trying to trying to create art. And it sounds kind of perverse in a, in a way to think about, oh, the, we have to set a deadline or to, to, to restrict the artist and the writer from having as much freedom as they can possibly have to complete their work. But the more I read into these things, the more I feel like actually by imposing a deadline and making it as short as possible on someone, what you tend to do if you if you are smart about setting the deadline is you you eliminate the part of the process that's not creative and not enjoyable. You eliminate procrastination and you sort of push yourself or, you know, as an editor, you push the writer to get into the creative mode quicker. And that's that's a pleasurable mood to be in. So... I think that if if we embrace deadlines, it's not the same thing as as embracing some sort of like workaholic, work drudge mentality. No, it's embracing you know living a life that's full of 
effective creative work and also eliminating procrastination and using that extra time to do other stuff, even just if that's like relaxing and not working at all. I'm Kwame Christian, and I am the CEO of the American Negotiation Institute, and I want you to check out my podcast, Negotiate Real Change. Listen to conversations with leaders in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space, and learn the secrets behind what it really takes to become a successful advocate, ally, and change maker in your organization. Check out Negotiate Real Change on your favorite podcast player. when when the, the book turned to um, thinking about sort of a play as a sort of serial deadline. And, and I did sort of think it's interesting because I sort of feel like you said, there's something about the idea, even the idea of being productive or like being aided in being productive sounds kind of droney and robot-like. Um, but then when we think about sort of real working artists, whether it's writers, but it's probably even more obvious with dancers or actors, it's actually an immovable fixed serial deadline that generates creativity, right? Like, so I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about going a little bit behind the scenes of like how much gets changed through the serial deadlines of a, of a play, for example. I went to the public theater in Manhattan, which is a wonderful institution. And uh, it's where Hamilton um, was sort of, de- where it debuted and they do Shakespeare in the park. And I saw the sort of development of a a play that was going to have its world premiere. And everyone involved, the director, the actor, the writer, it was a fully like collaborative endeavor, but it was definitely organized on a strict schedule. They set the opening date before they even started the first day of rehearsal. So they knew they had to work towards that. But I didn't know as much about the theater as I thought I did because I was like, oh, well, I'm going to show up and go to, um, you know, the final dress rehearsal and see what that's like. And that'll tell me about, you know, meeting a deadline because that's the last day before, you know, the, the show goes on. And really, like, final dress rehearsal, when it comes to thinking about the development of, of the play and the performance, is more or less the middle of the process, not the end of the process. You know, there, there's a whole series of rehearsals, and then there's a week called Tech Week, which is where they uh, fine-tune a lot of the staging and the blocking and the lighting. Then there's dress rehearsal, and then there's previews. And I didn't know this before I started researching the book, but previews, like the performances, the script itself can change dramatically during during that time. The play that I saw, it changed in significant ways, but the one that I read about that changed the most was was Hello Dolly, which is you know one of the most successful musicals of all time. That changed dramatically during previews. So previews is when you have a paying audience after final dress rehearsal. Uh, you have weeks of preview performances, but it, it's still not officially opening night. You know that that hasn't happened yet. And so for Hello Dolly, they um, I mean, they went through so many script changes during previews that they started hiding actors in barrels on the stage so they could um, <laughs> prompt the performers if they forgot what the latest you know script change was that day. And they wrote a whole new song right there during the preview process. And that took the play from something that was apparently like leaving audiences pretty cold to the smash success. Like just just during that revision process that happened officially after it started going in front of audiences and during during the preview process. So yeah, just learning about that that how collaborative that whole process was and also just how much the calendar dictated the development of the performance was eye opening. And it did sort of remind me again of, of my work in magazines. It's like, you know, all these people coming together, um, all relying on each other um to get things done on time. And I think there's something sort of alchemical and magical about that that when it works well, produces great art and great written art in, in magazines and, and great performance art on, on the stage. Yeah, no, I find it moving because it seems like it, it, it kind of shows, it's like the deadline is a sort of productive crisis. And if anything, even more for creative work than for other kind of work, where it sort of seems like it's actually like generates creativity, I thought was really kind of moving and interesting and made me think differently about writing and think about how many how many writers got their start going through the productive crisis of a deadline of just whether it's like being a news reporter or an ad 
or someone writing ad material. And I thought, oh, it's not an accident. I just thought that was one of the things your books really highlighted was the way that it's not just about managing an unpleasant thing, but about a kind of crisis that generates that kind of magic, like you're talking about. Yeah. No, no. I mean, it, I mean, it reminds me also of like, you know, Dickens turning in the next installment of like a serial novel and people like literally, you know, waiting at the, for the ship to come in to, to see that. I mean, that, that sort of is another example of like the time putting pressure on an artist and having it, um, lead to, you know, a happy outcome and not just if I feel like this sort of painful drudgery. I mean, Hemingway too, right? He was like, he was a newspaper man. I think that, that there is something to that, that, that these people who've sort of honed their chops as artists in a field that had more demands on them time-wise. I wonder if there's a thesis to be written about the late style of those people too. Like once, once the constraints were sort of lifted, does that change the what, what their art looks like? I mean, certainly it does. Will you tell us a little bit about how uh, you ended up selling televisions at, at Best Buy? <laughs> so nine organizations in the book, for all of them, I try to get in through the front door to report on them. And I, I, you know, I wrote to whoever I could find and just said like, hey, can I come and observe what you do? So that's true for John George restaurants. It was true for the farmers at the produced Easter lilies every year. And I went to the Air Force and embedded with them for a while, like and as they prepared for a disaster relief mission. And I always had it in my mind that I was going to go. Like one deadline that seemed very interesting to me was Black Friday. It's like a, a huge shopping day. It's it's a, some huge portion of uh, most big box retailers' revenue for the year, and it just seemed kind of crazy. And I wanted to see what it looked like on the ground. And so with Best Buy, I, you know, I wrote to them and I said, I, you know, I'm, I'm writing this book. I'd love to come and just observe. And I got a response and they said, oh, sure, let me, you know, look into this for you. And eventually the PR people just ghosted me, like they stopped writing back. And I tried and tried and tried for a year. And then, I mean, I was running out of time. It was the, the fall before my, my book was due. And, and so I decided, well, if I want to see Black Friday, I'm going to have to figure out a different way to do this. And so this, that's the only chapter where, that I reported undercover. I got a job as a seasonal salesman at Best Buy. Um, and I started in October and worked through Black Friday itself. And I almost didn't get hired because I'm definitely not qualified for that job. But I think they needed. But people. you had some good game in the interview, I thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I accidentally got myself a, a raise on the spot because I had a competing offer from Target. Um, it was interesting to, to, to report that chapter undercover because people were not, you know, they didn't know I was a reporter, so they weren't they weren't changing their behavior to make themselves look better or make the company look better, um, for my sake at least. But I was still I was almost like touching how much the people I met cared about their jobs. I mean, to the extent of maybe being too competitive in when in, when it comes to selling TVs, but they were really into it, and um, I learned I mean a lot from my colleagues. I was in the TV department, um, and I. I had to learn everything that I could possibly learn in a short amount of time about flat screen TVs. Uh, and I was still definitely the worst salesman there. But it was fascinating to see how business as usual worked at Best Buy. And then uh, once we started gearing up for Black Friday, I was impressed by like how thoughtful the process was uh, in terms of preparing the store for that holiday, for the shopping day. Like they, they took it very seriously. We had training sessions, full staff to prepare for the day. And then on the day itself, the store is totally different. And they like totally remake the store to make it possible. And somehow it all comes together. And Best Buy has an unusually good track record for Black Friday compared to like Walmart and some other stores. Like they don't have the like chaos and the trampling and all the like bad things that we read about about Black, Black Friday. Like it was a fairly orderly day, although entirely exhausting when I was working there. And then what, what were the sort of, when you were putting this book together, I mean, you must have had some kind of, you, had, you did your early research and you had, I'm sure, some like ideas going into the book, but what would you say shifted in the process of reporting? Well, I mean, I sort of thought when I was writing the book that I would have a couple of failure cases, like that basically some places would, would not succeed in meeting their deadline. But w whether it was luck or not, I, I happened to get access to and pick places that were just really good at getting things done on time. So that that was a surprise and a shift. But ultimately, I 
decided to stop worrying about that there were not enough failures in the book and just focus on, <laughs> on, on what went right. I provided the failure in the Best Buy chapter by being so incompetent at selling TVs. Um, and, and I mean, I guess it's like a, a requisite question, but did you meet your book deadline when you were <laughs> writing this book? I did. Actually, it was interesting. You know, books are kind of notorious for coming in past their deadline. Um, like most authors don't don't meet their contractual deadline. And my editor said, oh, you know, here here's in the contract. It says, you know, March 1st, 2020. But don't worry about that. Like, I won't even notice if you don't turn it in by that date. And I had to tell him, like, no, actually, you need to take this seriously because <laughs> I'm going to take this seriously. Um, and I have to know that you're taking it seriously. So I, I steered him back towards you know, being a little bit more disciplined, and which would help me be more disciplined, too. But yeah, then, like, ultimately, the stuff I was learning on the ground really helped me with every stage of the book. Um like one very important decision that I that I made was to create a calendar for reporting, but then also make sure that I both did the reporting and finished the chapter before I moved on to the next one. And creating that sort of like that structure really helped me stay on target. And, you know, the idea to do it that way sort of came from talking to people at Airbus, the aerospace company, and how they would create a, a schedule for building a, a jet airplane um and which is in like a week i think or six days or, six days yeah, yeah. Every six days at, at this one facility in, in alabama they do a jet every six days in in hamburg germany it's even more it's even quicker than that but they talk about this idea of, of planning right to left which is basically like you you know your final deadline and then you build a calendar out um moving backward in time to where you are and I did the same thing with my book. I was like, okay, I have to write these nine chapters or seven chapters and nine organizations. And I'm going to create, you know, a strict schedule that I'm going to stick to for each of the chapters. And uh, that meant that by the time I got to March, when I was supposed to turn in my book, I wasn't rushing around. I was like, basically already, I was already done. And I love that you had to talk your editor into commi mutually committing to the deadline. Because I agree, there's something about publishing where... I don't know if it comes from that idea you talked about, like kind of give the artist their space or if it's just the way it's always been. But I've yeah. never gotten a hard deadline really in my life. <laughs> and I'm always like praying for one and setting them myself. Yeah. So that's funny. That's not my memory of like of when we worked together. I mean, you, you wrote several pieces for me at Harper's and I... Uh, I don't... Well, I thought you... you, you I thought you met your deadlines for that. I, no, no, I do. I, I actually... Well, I don't want to say anything. I'm not bad at meeting my deadlines because <laughs> I have a natural anxiety that kind of builds around them. Hey, folks, Rufus here. If you're a fan of our interviews with physicians, scientists, or entrepreneurs, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from leading venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, A16Z. Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with A16Z general partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights and actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy, an AI expert and in Citro CEO, Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to the show. The deadlines Chris has been describing may be high stakes, but they're not life or death. Sub deadlines though are. During the audience Q&A portion of this virtual book launch, a member of the Next Big Idea community asked, quote, watching the withdrawal of US troops from Afghanistan, I was reminded of the horrendous collateral damage that can result when you set a deadline that's too hard to meet. Did this change how you view deadlines? Here's how Chris responded. I guess I will say that by having a deadline, that is the reason that, you know, 100,000 plus people were evacuated from Afghanistan. Like I, I, the deadline did spur the United States government to action. If I were to advise the Biden administration on its Afghanistan policy, which I certainly am not going to do uh, and have not done, there are ways to, you know, think about deadlines and spacing them out and, and creating like 
soft deadlines, soft opens, all these strategies could actually have been effective in a situation like Afghanistan. But there's a different Biden administration goal that uh, I, I was thinking about in terms of deadlines. And I wrote about this in the New York Times, uh, which was basically their, one of the first deadlines they set was the a vaccination deadline. So they wanted to get at first, they said 100 million doses administered by the end of the first 100 days, and then they upped that to 200 million doses. And I think by articulating that deadline so clearly, and even internally, it helped them organize their own thinking about the vaccination rollout. I think because they set that deadline, that they met it. You know, if they hadn't set it, it might have slipped, slipped beyond that. Another question on a different scale. Do the types of things we delay to complete in favor of the adrenaline rush reveal anything particular about ourselves? I've always tended to delay writing assignments, feeling like I do my best work when I'm pressed for time. Yeah, I mean, that's that's sort of one of the central preoccupations of the book is sort of how do you get that effect? That's the, de- that's the deadline effect. It's like, um, you know, the power of the deadline to spur you to action. But how do you get that urgency, but without the sort of last minute panic, the the possibility of uh, making errors that you can't correct. I mean, all sorts of things that come with actually doing things at the last minute. And it's interesting, like, it's not just difficult things that we delay. We also delay pleasurable things. In the introduction to the book, I talk about an experiment done with uh, a coupon for a free slice of cake. And in the experiment, they gave out two versions of the coupon. One said you can get a free slice of cake in the next three weeks. And the other said you can get a free slice of cake in the next two months. So there's a short deadline and a long deadline. And I think five times as many people in the three-week deadline group got their cake than the two, two-month deadline. So those are the shorter deadline. We're five times more likely to actually go get that cake. And you know, it's just, it's it's a built-in bias that we have. We we sort of tend to think that we have more time than we do. And so by using the strategy, first and foremost, of setting a short, concrete deadline for yourself, you are going to be more likely to get um, whatever it is you want to get done uh, accomplished, you know, whether it's getting a piece of cake or a, a big creative project or a, a project at work or whatever it is you're sort of trying to tackle. Um, another question that's come in says, do you think that overfixation on deadlines is contributing to the existential crises we are currently generating and experiencing? Well, I, no. I mean, like, I, I am a believer in deadlines. I, I'm not just for the book, but I, I'm, I'm a convert. Like, I think, I think we should embrace them. I think that if we can get things done, let's say you don't like your job, right? If you embrace deadlines and you're productive, then you are done with your work quicker and then you can go do what is whatever it is you do like, you know? Uh, you can go on longer hikes. You can do more video gaming, whatever it is. Like, So embrace the deadlines if you don't like your job. If you do like your job, embrace the deadlines because, you know, when you're doing productive work, it makes you happy. I, and I saw that, like you mentioned the Easter lily people, like that's not the easiest job. It's definitely dirty. You're like, you know digging bulbs out of the ground but there was a sort of sense of like shared common purpose and productivity that those people seemed happy and the people in in the with john george in the restaurant world like there there are obviously terrible restaurant bosses out there and they make their employees miserable but at john george like the process was so orderly and they were so good at opening a restaurant that everyone i talked to seemed like you know determined to do their job well, um, excited to do it, and and they believed in their mission. So I, I guess if the premise of the question is that there's sort of like deadlines drive us to toward burnout, I don't think that's quite true. I think deadlines drive us to get work done uh, with the least amount of suffering. And then what we do with the extra time is up to us. You know, uh, I'm going to get it slightly wrong, but you, you bring in this term that people have described of I think hyperbolic underestimation. I think the second word I've got wrong. But what I thought was interesting there was the idea that we both we both think we're going to get the Sydney Opera House built in three years and for seven million dollars or whatever it might be. But at the same time, we like underestimate how good it's going to feel when it's done. That was really interesting to me. That yeah. that, that issue of uh, underestimating the pleasure of meeting, and it seems like that's part of what you're describing. 
you yeah. witnessed when you were doing your reporting, like how much pleasure reaching these deadlines was giving or yeah no exactly hyperbolic discounting yeah it's it's that's right discounting we we discount both rewards and punishments in the future so we underestimate how good it's going to feel to finish that project and then we also try to delay work because we feel like oh in the future it won't be as painful to like get that done but, you know, we should push back against that because obviously it's, I mean, it's not rational. And I think it's, um, we should embrace that good feeling of, of being productive in our work right now. We should, why, why would you put that off? You know, uh, I was going to ask you one last question um, that's coming in from the audience. Can you mm-hmm. share the deadlines you're currently trying to meet and how <laughs> on or off track you are? This is interesting because ever since I've been writing a book and letting people know that I'm writing a book about deadlines, I've been very serious about meeting deadlines because um, I think it's expected of me. And just that expectation has actually helped me a lot. But just last week, was it last week or two weeks ago, I was working, I, I've been working as an editor at the New York Times Magazine. And um, uh, I was working on a piece that was so complicated and had so many moving parts and, and sort of had to be vetted by legal teams that it we we missed our deadline. And um it was supposed to be done by 8 p.m. on Thursday, and I think we were done by 9, which doesn't sound that bad, but it's actually, like, we we actually went past the, like, drop dead, you're in trouble if you go past this time. <laughs> and I felt pretty mortified. And then someone said, hey, aren't you the guy that wrote the book about deadlines? Like, how did you... <laughs> so this is, ob- this is obviously going to be haunting me <laughs> for the rest of my life. But, you know, I, I said this about Biden, too. Um, even the deadlines that he's missed, and he's missed some... He, the administration has made more progress towards its goals than they would have without deadlines. And that's sort of the way I felt about this, this sort of missing this deadline for the New York Times. It's like, sure, we missed it, but we actually still finished the article. And if we hadn't had those hard stop deadlines, you know, it, the, the process probably would have stretched on forever because there were so many yeah. things to like to, to nail down with that piece. So the deadline still helped us, uh, even if we didn't quite meet it. I think uh, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for the book and thank you for making time to chat. And um, and I want to thank you for having been a wonderful editor who did set deadlines. And also it, it's the, the collaboration of the deadline, the sense that um, on the one hand, deadlines are imaginary. On the other hand, when both people believe in them, they sort of work and you always had that as an editor. So you always sort of responded promptly it just sort of felt like it was things were gaining energy rather than losing energy because you know all of those things can happen so i wanted to thank you for that too it was great to get to have a chat yeah and thanks everyone for listening too would you like to hear other authors techniques for slaying the mighty beast that is procrastination download the next big idea app and check out our book bites I highly recommend Effortless, make it easier to do what matters most by Greg McEwen. We did a podcast episode with Greg recently, which you can listen to ad-free on our app. And you'll also find the key insights from his book in his book bite. You may also want to check out Oliver Berkman's 4,000 Weeks Time Management for Mortals, an extraordinary book that was just featured on our app. And don't stop there. In our app, you'll also find fascinating video e-courses, other riveting conversations like this one, and much, much more. Search for Next Big Idea in your app store right now. If you like this show, please leave us a review and a five-star rating if you think we've earned it. Rocco86 left one recently. He wrote, amazing, one of my, if not my favorite podcast. Very insightful, informative, and joyful. Thank you, Rocco. Special thanks to Chris Cox and Rivka Galchin. We get this show out the door every week thanks to the deadline masters on our team. This episode was written and produced by the ever-punctual Caleb Bissinger. Our executive producer is Michael Kavnat. Theme music by Costa Galanopoulos. Sound design by Mike Toda. I'm your host, Rufus Griscom. See you next week.